Blackpink. Hey wonderful people, this is a really intriguing story. Now, what happened in October 1957? First human satellite. So anything orbiting planet Earth before October 1957 isn't man-made? Hmm. So what exactly did people see on the night of February the 9th, 1913, where multiple objects were seen re-entering Earth's atmosphere from orbit. Hey and welcome back. Every major observatory keeps records and the record keepers or stars meet Tony Mish. Tony is the archivist for the giant Lick Observatory and Tony's also worked at Mount Wilson and their records are fantastic. We need to study them and compare with today's night sky to discover strange things. And that's what Beatrice Villaroel does. She's a Spanish astrophysicist, and now she's working with Avi Loeb about the Galileo Project. Historical data of strange stuff accurately recorded can be compared with today's night sky. Beatrice has found transients. That's strange things that have changed. Stars that have appeared and stars that have disappeared, but also strange sightings. And the astronomy archivist Tony Mish, also a family friend, reached out and said, hey Simon, did you know that the Earth had something orbiting it way back in 1913? Well, let's look at the big picture. It was obviously an asteroid. Well, maybe not. Asteroids are rogue rocks that live somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. And most of the time they're happy in the asteroid belt, but occasionally like a billiard ball, they hit each other and one of them goes bling out towards the sun and makes an orbit. Some of them crash into the sun, others form stable orbits. And it's really important to know if our little orbit of planet Earth is ever going to intersect woo, in the future with one of these rocks. Most of the big asteroids over a kilometer in diameter have been tracked and we know that they're trivial. But very few of the sub one kilometer asteroids have been tracked. You can imagine that an 895 meter diameter asteroid is going to give everybody a bad day. So they are now slowly being catalogued and most of them are put into the category of trivial. But occasionally they get a non-trivial, which is a euphemism for it's going to hit us. But there's very few of those. But you need to understand how asteroids work. They come from space and they go bonk straight in. They don't orbit Earth, they don't slow down, go into orbit like the Starship Enterprise and send down a shuttlecraft. Uh, no, they just are death plunge asteroids. Whoopie doo, blush. So what did they see in 1913? Let's read the description of the day. The Great Meteor Procession. An odd and still unexplained parade of meteors on February the 9th, 1913, dazzled viewers from Canada all the way down to Brazil. The origin of the great meteor procession is still unknown. It was unlike a normal meteor shower, where zippy streaks of light radiate outward from a single point. On February the 9th, 1913, strange objects appeared in formation following each other on nearly identical paths. A report says their pace across the sky was stately and measured. It was such a big event, people even did illustrations. Even at the time in 1913, people knew that normal meteors just plunge into the atmosphere and vaporize due to the friction with the air. These objects had been in Earth orbit, maybe for weeks, maybe for years, until they re-entered the atmosphere in procession. What exactly 
were they? Well, it's very, very unusual, mysterious, and unlikely that they're just space rocks. An asteroid plunges into Earth. It doesn't stay in Earth orbit and then re-enter. So it was a genuine mystery from history, a great term. We don't know what these objects were. Probably rocks, but then how did they get into orbit? So thank you, Tony Mish, for being an archivist, for keeping records of these amazing events. I think there's more hidden away that you and I need to look at. Suddenly, there's a new source of the truth being out there. But there's more. Here's a bonus feature just for you. An interview with Tony Mish and Beatrice about the historic data kept by observatories. In the 1950s, the US Navy carried out a major star survey photographing the night sky to produce a database for the US military. Its primary use was to make a star chart for the new ICBM missile guidance system. But what they didn't know was it became the last look at the night sky before the space race began with the launch of Sputnik 1 in October 1957. At the time, there were no man-made objects in orbit. This turned out to be the last time to record the pristine sky that our ancestors wondered about, asking, are we alone? Today, we are still asking that question. SETI keeps searching for signs of life, but there might be a new way to search for extraterrestrials. This time, using that very same 1950s star chart and to compare it with the stars of today. This might just reveal hidden secrets by answering one question. Has anything changed? And if so, are those changes a sign of distant life? Amazingly, I can tell you today, the answer is yes. This has been a really exciting film for me to make for you. If you enjoy this kind of content, please consider subscribing and give it a thumbs up. It really helps build my channel. You are about to meet two experts in the field of astronomy. Tony Mish. Tony's worked for major US telescopes and is currently archiving a historic collection for the Lick Observatory. Beatrice Villaroyal, she runs the Vasco Project. Its mission to search for interstellar anomalies by comparing the night sky of today with the night sky of the past. So I want to ask this incredibly basic question. With all these UFOs, UAPs, whatever they're called, flying around, have they ever been seen by astronomers at our observatories? So I asked Tony Mish to explain how observatories work and could they spot a UAP? Astronomers are specialists, so when they come to the telescope to make their observations, uh, they are in pursuit of a particular astrophysical problem, and the observations have to be tailored accordingly. The targets to be observed, uh, the instrument to be used, uh, the type of data to be collected are all carefully chosen and planned well in advance of the observing run. Can you take us through the normal day at an observatory? On the day of the astronomer's arrival, the observatory staff configure the telescope and the instrument and instrumentation in accordance with the observer's needs. 
When the actual observing begins, everyone, the observer, the uh, support staff are all narrowly focused on the job of, uh, of observing and collecting the best possible data that can be obtained and making the most efficient use of uh, the telescope time. So do you think it might be possible that an astronomer could spot a sign of extraterrestrial life? If the observer sees the sky at all, it'll only be a tiny slice of it. And then on a television screen, um, and really just for the purpose of guiding the telescope. This narrow field of view taken together with the tight observing parameters make the chances of a serendipitous discovery unrelated to the work at hand vanishingly small. However, these constraints do not apply in the special case of wide field survey telescopes, uh, specifically designed to image large areas of the sky and with the aim of discovering new phenomena. These wide field survey telescopes, primarily funded to spot possible Earth colliding asteroids. By taking multiple pictures of the same night sky, they can spot objects that move. That's exactly how the PanStars project spotted Oumuamua. As it arrived from interstellar space and rendezvoused with our solar system. So what other visitors are hiding in their survey? These wide field telescopes publish all their data. The massive image archives that these surveys produce are global open source and therefore uh, available to any astronomer anywhere in the world with an internet connection to mine for new discoveries. So they're a great place to look for anomalies. And that's exactly what Beatrice and the Vasco project is doing. But she has added another dimension. She's comparing modern star surveys with the old star surveys from over 70 years ago. And what she has found is startling. Some stars have vanished. Others are seen today, but were not visible in the 1950s. So could whatever drives these vanishing stars be a new force of nature? Or are they evidence of distant life forms with advanced technology modifying their suns? I'm particularly fascinated by time domain astronomy. Extreme transients have a wonderful tendency of rejecting or strengthening some of our best theories. And when it comes to anomalies, well, they are very fascinating because they can really test the boundaries of what we know and we might sometimes find new physical phenomena. Already the Vasco project has found hundreds of these anomalies. For example, in the Vasco project we found 100 short-lived transients. Now we think that most of these, or we think actually they all, are probably natural phenomena, but we don't know what they are or what is causing these transients that we know are very short-lived and only uh, appear and disappear within a few minutes. Something else that we discovered more recently uh, is a small region of the sky where nine transients appear and disappear within half an hour. We don't know if this image that we found, that is from 1950s, is actually a real observation or if it could be some type of contamination. We still don't know and I hope that we'll find out rather soon. What else might be out there? I'm particularly fond of surveys from the 1950s. Why is it so? Well, because in the 1950s our sky was clean from any human contamination. There were no satellites and not millions of pieces of space debris as it is today. That means that the catalogues from the 1950s, the images from the 1950s, are goldmine in order to search for alien space probes. You can help the Vasco project by comparing old and new stellar photographs, looking for differences that might just be the clue that reveals the presence of an alien civilization. Or a new phenomenon in our universe? 
We have currently 150,000 candidates of possible vanishing stars and we need your help to actually look through them. For this, we have created our website that can be found here. And it would be great if you could go to the website and help us uh, to look through some of the images at least. We live in interesting times. Not only can you now help the Vasco project search for anomalies in space, for the first time, a major government has admitted that UAPs, UFOs, whatever you want to call them, are real. They've captured them with multiple sensors, meaning they're really out there. But they also admit they don't know what they are. So the science community have stepped up and want to use their skills to answer that mystery. Avi Loeb's Galileo project will use specialized scientific measuring equipment to take that clear picture of a UAP that we've all been waiting for. And Tony Mish thinks that that's the best approach to solve the UAP mystery. I think the best approach to UAP, as has been suggested, is uh, a dedicated array of specially designed uh, instruments to, uh, to search and detect uh, these phenomena. And wonderfully, Beatrice is also working for the Galileo Project, and she's adding the dimension of time to solve the problem. Because maybe hidden in the past are answers for our future. By doing all this data mining, I hope that Vasco will succeed in finding a vanishing object or maybe an object that has appeared that wasn't there 70 years ago. I think this will be extremely exciting because then we can really maybe find something that is indicative of extraterrestrials and their technology. At least I'm hoping for that. That's great. So am I. Because... The truth is out there.